So sorry. So I will be moderating and facilitating this discussion alongside with Lane, um, Riley, and Noah, who are other students part of COBA. And so before we begin, um, we're not going to do any regular um, introductions just because there's a lot of people here and we do have only an hour for a discussion. And so before we begin, um, we acknowledge the traditional and ancestral territory of the Pasca, Pueblo Yaqui and Tohono O'odham Nation on which we are residing, learning, working and organizing. We need to honor indigenous communities and lands while sustaining them by acknowledging and dismantling systems that have caused and continue to cause injustices. Again, we only have an hour and we do have an agenda that we're gonna get through. Um, and it's gonna be a conversation and based on our last meeting, we hope that it's a lot better. And so next we have um, Noah and he's gonna recap what happened at the last COPA meeting, just so that we're in the right headspace for this meeting. Hello, my name's Noah and I use he, they pronouns. Um, so COBA presented the administration at the University of Arizona with a list of 21 demands, which were expected to be met by the 2020-21 fiscal year. In addition to that, we had a meeting in July where members of COBA brought up the ways in which UA administrators handled the events that took place on June 6. We, re we received what seemed like a forced apology with little to no meaning behind it. Unfortunately, during the meeting, administrators were on their phones, unable to look directly in the camera and, and unable to listen and learn from the many informed members of COBA. The meeting did not end up going how we initially thought it would. Ultimately, the UA administration disrespected and offended several of us and we felt like nothing was accomplished. Moving forward, we hope that it is different and more productive. We ask that you come to this meeting and be present and committed like you said you would be at the last meeting. Thank you. And now we're just gonna go uh, through the community norms. We're not gonna read um, the descriptions, but I hope, I'm hoping that Kendall was able to send out the email and that y'all were able to look over them, but we're just gonna go quickly through them and Lane and Malaika will be doing that. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Lane, I use she, her, her pronouns. And first, we're going to start with the community norms. Um, we're just going to briefly read the bold part. We're not really going to get into it. Um, so one, this is a student-led discussion space. So um, it's based on us and not really on you. And um, all you have to do is answer our questions and our demands. Um, two, when answering questions, remember to keep responses comprehensive and concise. Last time, there were members um, from your administration group that were just going over and over in circles and we didn't really get the answer, so we're trying to uh, prevent that. Number three, understand the emotion in this space and important, importance of what we are discussing. Like I said, this is a very sensitive topic of inequality, racial issues and stuff, so we really want you to be aware of that and not just possibly say anything that could trigger anyone. Well, remember the humanity of each other, which is the same thing, basically the same thing as number three. We are not statistics, we are not um, Google Docs, we are not all these meetings, we are actually people that you know want to have a better life in the University of Arizona. Five, come prepared to the meetings, but don't read off a script. So basically we want you guys to take these meetings as important as they are and how we see them and you know, with the coming um, questions, you'll see that we're going to be asking you about what we've done. So that's what it means by come prepared. Um, for six, if you don't know the answer, just say that you don't know. You don't need to try to come up with one. It's just best that there's transparency through this meeting. Just flat out, I don't know the answer to that question and just keep going. We don't have that much time to waste. Don't have a response to just have one. We are not a business interaction. We are a community that's trying to grow and get better together. So treat this as such, not like we're a business. Um, students are not your subordinates. We're not here to listen to y'all. Y'all are here to listen to us. This is for us. Do not come defensive when we express a point you may disagree with. Again, acknowledging our pain, our trauma, and how we're sharing it with you to have a better and safer environment. Don't discredit that and don't try to get defensive if you feel as if 
you were the one who did something wrong. Even if you are, you're supposed to be listening. Um, and don't hyper-focus on data as the only form of factual evidence. What, are, what we are telling you often isn't quantifiable, yet still deserves the same priority as any given data set. So don't look at us as experiments or scientific. We're humans, so be respectful, please. Thank you so much. Um, so in order to start off our conversation, we do have one question and anyone from administration could answer this, but reflecting on what happened at our last meeting and everything that we've spoken about, um, what have you all done so far in the last month since we haven't been able to meet until now? Lisa, would you like to take that question? I see Brian has his hand raised. Oh, okay. Um, you asked uh, us for a breakdown of UAPD's budget or expenditures, and I'm putting it in uh, the chat right now. It's on our UAPD webpage for everybody to look at for you. Yeah, so we were able to look over this when we received the email and one of our biggest concerns was that it's not as comprehensive as we need it to be because it's very ambiguous in terms of like, when we look at operating cost, what is operations? And this, the way that this is um, organized in terms of like, the graphing and everything, it doesn't really show us what we need to know. And so um, we were gonna wait until the end of this meeting to ask, but just for your notes, we are wondering if we can get a more comprehensive um, graph that details other, like other things within the UA budget that like really expands on operating costs and what that means, aids and dispatch, unformed, uh, uniform salaries and benefits and just really outlining what all of these um, categories, I guess, mean and look like and just like other numbers within this budget. Lisa? I'm happy to commit to share more information about what each of these categories mean. I think that um, it would also be helpful for you all to have context for uh, what the, when we look at the university's overall budget, what's, what does institutional support mean? What does student support mean? So I'm gonna put in the, the chat a link to our financial services office uh, website, which shows the NACUBO, National Association of College and University Business Officers, the definitions that, that we have to use in order to categorize expenses. So when you, when you put the, the university's budget in context, you see the two graphs. This will help um, us all understand what's in each of those buckets. I know that the last time that we uh, met, we had questions about what were in the student services, and there's an explanation uh, in this link for what's categorized as student services. And we use our accounting system uh, to do that categorization. But, Happy to share more information. If you want to give, uh, give me a sense of what details you'd like to have, I'm happy to review that and provide uh, what, what is possible given the limits of our accounting system. Thank you. Shall I add on there? Um, Thanks everybody for coming together in this meeting. It's good to see everybody and have the opportunity to discuss uh, our shared concerns. Um, I think the most important um, change in the last month has been that we were able to welcome Ivy Banks uh, to join us as AVP for equity and inclusion. Um, and I see Ivy's with us, so I'm glad that she's here. Um, and I hope that many of you have already had the opportunity to meet with Ivy. But importantly for COBA, uh, Ivy has already um, definitely uh, started to engage deeply with your concerns and to uh, start 
uh, helping to support the university to um, move in the directions that we all want to see to ensure that we have much better supports for uh, um, BIPOC students generally and black students in particular. Uh, Riley has a response to that. Go ahead, Riley. Yeah, can you be more specific um, about like what you've done? Because that's just like a lot of vague words that's not really addressing. Particularly, what are you doing like with the list of demands and like which ones have you worked on instead of just saying, oh, we're going to help you out. Like, what does that actually mean? Okay, so I am in a conundrum here because I got a stern message that you don't want me to talk at any lengths, but now you want me like Go ahead and talk. I'm gonna need some guidance. Go ahead and answer the question. We'll stop you. In two minutes, or do we have a longer discussion on the demands? Um, I would say start your answer and if it's going somewhere, we'll give you more time and if not, we'll cut you off in two minutes. But go ahead. Yeah. How about we just do a written response then? I'd rather not get into that dialogue that way. That doesn't feel like that's going to be a really good engagement. So can you just list, you know, maybe some bullet points of anything that you've done or no? All righty. Let me like, You don't have to give a full description, but just like some bullet points so that we just oh. you know, to. Yeah, let me pull up some detail then. Thank you. Alrighty, so number one was, um, uh, let me see, an apology, which I think we can all agree that we held a meeting and we essentially uh, have a difference of opinion about um, the celebration of Black Lives event. So that uh, we already discussed in the previous meeting, um, I guess. We um, have discussed the request to disinvest in uh, UAPD. Um, I think we can have ongoing dialogue about that, but I think we also agree that we do not wish to reduce the budget for UAPD, even though we want to ensure that we've got strong financial support for our cultural and resource centers. Number three is a request to or demand, I should say, for the University of Arizona to sever its ties with Tucson Police Department, Border Patrol and ICE. We don't think that that's something that we can agree to. Importantly, um, we need to make sure that we partner with those entities um, and we still believe that that partnership is our best way to keep our students and staff and faculty well protected. Um, uh, what's the next one is funds allocated to UAPD be redirected to relieve furlough and permanent budget cuts. UAPD um, is also subject to furloughs and budget cuts, um, but we will not be, um, let me see, differentially applying uh, furlough and budget cuts to UAPD, but rather we've made a decision that we will institutionally absorb those costs um, and have all units on campus share in uh, the burden of getting us through this current fiscal crisis um, through a, uh, an equitable allocation of um, the furloughs and the budget cuts. Um, do, 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 do. Sorry, I have a quick question still... before you continue on. Sorry. Sure. Go for Just it. Quick. Um, could you tell me how ICE and Border Patrol is protecting students at the University of Arizona? Yeah, so ICE, for example, uh, is the entity that issues visas to our international students. Uh, and it's tremendously important that we have good working relationships with them so that our international students can continue to get their visas when they come to this country to study at this university. What about the undocumented students? That is a challenging issue, as you know, and one that we continue to advocate in support of. Uh, and I think that there's a, a sort of a broad sense of optimism that the coming election will change the narrative in Arizona, uh, which in a direction that would be supportive of the university's position on this issue, but absolutely supportive of our students that are in that situation of being undocumented students. Go ahead and continue on with what you're saying, I guess. Or unless, Marianne, did you have something that you wanted to say? Yeah, I think that 
she's just going through, Lisa, you're going through the list of demands and I think we've heard everything that we are going to say at the previous meeting. And so I don't think it's anything new in terms of like what you have done in the last four months in terms of addressing these lists of demands. I also want to comment on the fact that just because you've hired a VP does not mean that she is going to be the savior and the fixer of all of these institutional discrimination and racism on our campus. And so applause to Ivy for joining the University of Arizona, but that does not mean that she's going to be the one fixer for all of these issues. Um, Marianne, I didn't say she was. I said she's a leader. I'd like us to respect that. Okay. Um, Mariah, you had a response? Yeah, kind of just going off what Marianne was saying in response to um, Liesl. Is that how you say your name? I'm sorry. Liesl, yeah. No, I don't mind. Whatever. Um, I think the point we're trying to get across is that um, while we do appreciate the hiring of a VP, I think it's important to note that um, you can't kind of use Ivy as a token. And um, while, you know, she does understand our pains and our frustrations because she walks our shoes. It's ultimately on the administration that is white. It's on you guys mm -hmm. to get, get these issues more because you don't walk in our shoes. And so I think it's unfair even to her to put all of this on her like, oh, you're a black woman, go fix all the issues for the black people. When I really think it's your guys' issues. The issues are always burdening black women to fix when it's not ours, it's yours. Mariah, but I couldn't I agree more. That. But I would like us to remember that Ivy is a leader. That's great, we are all leaders. And we appreciate Ivy for being here, but I just don't want all the work to have to fall on Ivy because it's not fair when it should be falling on you guys. And I don't want you guys to think that because you hired a black VP that that's just the end and things are great. Because it's I not, hear it's you extremely enough. strongly, Moran. We are united on that point. Um, I think Lisa so I don't know how to deal with it. So you have 21 issues, 21 demands. We've done a fair bit of both thinking, but also action. I don't know how to communicate that. If you don't want to do it now, then we'll just write it out and we'll just share it digitally. And that's okay too. I'm happy either way. Um, but this doesn't feel like a, a dialogue about what we can do better, but that's, I'll do whatever, I'll take whatever path you prefer. I think Lisa had her hand raised and then Kendall and then Riley. Thank you, Marianne. I'll, I'll ask you a question for actually, how do I unraise my hand? There we go. Uh, <laughs> I'll ask you a question first. Uh, I do have some updates that I wanted to share uh, with you all as to actions that we've taken since our last meeting. And I had uh, come prepared with them kind of in the order of the, the demands, like uh, Provost Folks was reading. Um, may I share just a few things with you and you can stop me um, if I've gone too long. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I don't think that we shared uh, in our last meeting that we were in the process of hiring a consultant to do an evaluation of the UAPD. Right. Uh, we now have that consultant under contract. The consult consultant is Mark Olis Healy. We worked with our UAPD Campus Advisory Board to select uh, this consultant and had unanimous support from the Campus Advisory Board for this particular consultant because of their experience with campus policing. Uh, they are national experts uh, for campus policing and uh, they will be doing a, a two-phased review that will start in the next few weeks and should finish in the first part of 2021. Uh, the first phase is getting broad input from our community and we have asked them to meet with, with COBA if you all would like to, uh, to have a session with Margolis Healy to be able to talk with them directly. Uh, the second phase of the, uh, the review evaluation will be, it's called Public Safety Management Study. And it has uh, a list of focus areas that I'd like to read. There are 11, I can't remember them all off the top of my head. So I, I know you didn't want me to read, but do you mind if I share them with you? 
Yeah. Um, could you also share everything else that you said in a written format, just so like we have it for documentation and you can just send it to um, the COBA email or share it with them and she'll just share it with us. Happy to. Thank so you. the focus areas are uh, role, mission, vision, and strategy, differential response alternatives, organizational climate, accountability, police oversight, transparency, equitable and unbiased campus safety services, community policing and community engagement, recruitment, selection, promotion, retention, and mentoring, training and professional development, collaboration with key stakeholders, and here by key stakeholders, Mar Margolis Healy specifically called out student affairs, equity and inclusion, Title IX, Office of General Counsel, risk management, facilities management, and then coordination with external partners. So that would be our uh, collaborations with local, state, federal law enforcement and other first responders. And then a high level review of our threat assessment policies and procedures. Uh, and this particular evaluation is, uh, we're, we're calling it redefining the campus safety partnership, uh, really focusing on the, the, the culture and the climate uh, and Chief Seastone and his team are already working with Margolis Healy to provide documents for this process. Um, would you all be willing to participate in a session uh, with our consultant? I think that um, after this meeting, we would want to look at the written statement and everything else that you send in the email, and then we'll like respond. But I think that's something that we just should think about as a COBA group and then we'll decide afterwards. But thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think Kendall and then Riley, and then I think that's it. May I just, I, I did have one more thing to, to share, but I can wait, let other people talk and come back okay. about another, uh, some thank other th uh, items that we've done since our last meeting. All right, cool. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I'll just be really quick um, that there have been some initiatives that have um, been implemented as, as a result from the uh, demands, um, one of which is the BEST website, which um, many students for several years have asked for um, a website where we could uh, report and for the university to track um, bias related incidents and making sure that students are getting connected to the right people. Um, the president has invested a million dollars um, for diversity, equity, and in inclusion initiatives, some of which are um, having an impact on the cultural centers already. The one thing that we should have had up by now, but we're still working on it, is a website that has a list of all of the demands and where we are in progress. So I just wanted to share that there are some tangible um, efforts that have been put in place, um, but not enough. Right, not enough. So just wanted to make sure you all knew that. Thank you, Kendall. Also, um, we were gonna wait until the end of this meeting, but in terms of the website, I knew that Selena was working on it with one of her um, office assistants. And um, it was back in July and it looked pretty much done. And we were wondering, just for your notes, if that website could be launched like at the end of October or sometime beginning of November, if that's possible. You don't have to have an answer right now, but like you can yeah. just respond afterwards. Good morning and thank you so much, Marianne. I appreciate that and I appreciate your voices this morning. Um, I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here and the um, response to that is I'm working on it. That was just transitioned over to me um, in the past week. Um, so it's been an uh, interesting first three weeks. Um, so that is on my priority list to have that done. Um, so that you'll be able to have that information to be able to visibly see where we are and to also to make that a non-static site so as we continue to update um, one of the things that we'll be doing is hiring a project manager um, that position is posted and we're moving forward with that very quickly um, so that person will help us to make sure that that site is not static but that information um, will be updated regularly as um, information changes and as we're able to achieve um, some of the accomplishments that we need to achieve in order to uh, meet the request. Thank you. Um, Riley? Yeah, uh, I think my comments I'm going to stay for the end of this discussion, um, but I also just wanted to add quickly about uh, the website. Uh, we were 
discussing as a group if we could add um, honoring voices demands as well to the website because I um, understand that they were supposed they wanted a website to help track their demands and they um, were turned down for that so we just want to show our solidarity and add theirs to the, our website as well. And then I also wanted to um, go back to the project manager. We understand that I'm looking at their um, the duties and responsibilities, and one of them is um, they will have specific and intentional focus on meeting express student lists of demands. And some of the questions that we had about this project manager is what kind of interaction or relationship will they have with COBA and administration? and in terms of like completing the list of demand. Because we understand that people are hired for these positions and there's VPs and um, managers and everything, but they don't really get done. Hence what happened with Ron Wilson and Joseph. And we don't want that to happen with um, this position. And so we just wanna understand what kind of relationship that will be and like what kind of access they will have to administration or if they're just there as a placement. If I may, they will report directly to me um, and I am holding them accountable for um, making sure that they have regular meetings with you and also with the administration to um, keep us updated as to where we are and then also hold accountable um, the other entities around the university that's responsible for other pieces um, of both the request. And I'm looking at all three layers of the demands um, from going back, there was three. Um, so we're looking at all three of those. So Riley, to go back to your sentiment, yes, that is also considered. And thank you so much for raising that voice. Um, so they will report directly to me. Um, and it's also important that they meet with you on a regular basis. And I know that um, Alex has been in touch with you um, to ensure that you're a part of the process for the hiring process. And we really want your voice to be heard there and also to work with you on what would look best for scheduling um, those regular um, meetings um, with the students so that your voice is heard throughout the process and um, while they're here and when they onboard. Thank you. Uh, the other question that we had is um, in terms of our list of demand, I would like to think that they're completely different from previous lists of demands because we're specifically asking for institutional support. And we understand that um, there are subgroups on our campus, such as the Cultural Resource Centers, um, Think Tank, SSRI, and all these other parts of our campus that are doing something to meet and address one part or aspect of the list of demands, but we are asking for institutional support. So what does it mean and look like for you all to institutionally support these lists of demands and to be anti-racist and to admit that the University of Arizona is not an exception when it comes to racial discrimination or other um, discrimination on our campus? And anyone can go for that question as well. I, if you don't mind, Marion, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, it, from my perspective, it means that it is all of our responsibilities that, that we must work collaboratively together as an executive team and with you all to ensure that we understand your requests and that we, we meet what is reasonable, uh, also looking at what's institutionally possible. Uh, I think that it's incumbent on us as an executive team um, to work together to change our culture uh, and to admit that there is much that we can do better here. I'd like to echo what Lisa said, we have to do this as a team. There's no question that we have to um, transform the institution. And this is the moment to do it. Anybody else want to respond to that question?
because I think that with um, when we talk about institutional support, I think one of the biggest things that the university needs to step away from is trying to bring in new people or trying to create committees and tax forces and all of these things that really just only derive away from the issue and from actually admitting the problems at our, at our university and being able to name these issues and being able to say that like, yes, the University of Arizona is racist. The University of Arizona does have structures and powers that are not anti-racist and that we need to change the structure and the institution in a way that is anti-racist. And I think that um, rather than focusing on the easy small little things that can be done, is just looking at the bigger picture of these issues of racism and discrimination on our campus and trying to create a value system that centers queer, trans, Black, Indigenous, people of color on our campus and being able to humanize our experiences on, on our campus and being able to give that institutional support. And I hope that makes sense. I think there's, um, the university has like responses and list of ways of addressing these issues that are not working. And so I think that, um, again, it's like, how do we, how do you all move away from what you've been doing for the past years and stepping into something new that actually works and that actually addresses these issues and that actually places, places prioritization or a level of importance on the people who are systemically affected by these issues. So Marian, I, I, I'd like to share what, how I think about this and um, Levi is here on this um, meeting as well and I'm glad to see him here. And we had a really robust conversation um, a couple of weeks ago um, and it's not new information, but I think that as an institution, being a land grant institution in particular and an HSI, we have a responsibility to uplift the students that are marginalized in many ways. And so one of the things that we talked about was access um, to um, Wi Fi and the internet, and that disproportionately impacted certain populations on our campus. And what steps can we take? And I know that Levi and I are on the same page about how do we make that happen for students? And I think that the pandemic really shed a light on, in, on a situation that has been existent, in existence for a long time about access. And I think that's something that we really need to invest in um, as an institution. And we have, we've done some things over um, the summer and the spring semester, but we need to do more. And that's just one example that I think about on a regular basis about what's the experience for those students who don't have access and how are they faring. And, you know, we're receiving, I know in my office, quite a few um, email messages, and so is Liesl, from parents who are concerned about the mental health of our students. And, and, and mental health has always been an issue, but it's even more so an issue for our student um, population and particularly, again, our, our BIPOC students. So we do have a lot of work to do, but a lot of it is really challenging to do, but it doesn't mean that we should run away from it. And I'm not suggesting that everyone is, but some people do. And some of us like to get our hands and fingernails dirty so that we can make a change. Thank you, um, Lonnie. Um, I just wanted to go off what Marianne said, like about how systems that have been in the U of A for years and years and years, uh, even though that injustice, that it's injustice or whatever, like um, it's going to be a big change and it's going to be something that's really, really like different. So um, that's why we also want like deadlines. Okay, when is the website going to be up? You know, at least give us like some sort of deadline and when is the, what, you know, how can we help with the hiring of a project manager, stuff like that? Because if we just leave you um, to your own like things, then we're gonna wait another four months for this next meeting. So I just, basically I'm just asking like, are we gonna be involved? Or like, is this like just up to y'all? Like, 
anyone can answer that. I'll speak up. And I thank you for asking that question. And again, it is the priority to get the website up and you asked by the, the end of October and I just got access and that will be my goal. And if I can't meet that, I will definitely reach out and let you know exactly why and be transparent with that. Um, if there's any challenges or barriers that are in the way, but that will be my goal. Um, and I don't see any reason at this point why would that can't be met. So I will continue to work through that and continue to have that conversation. Um, just let me know who I need to reach out to and who will be my point of contact as I went through the interview process. You were very apparent, you were very transparent with me, you sent the information and I appreciate that so very much. And then also with the project manager, um, I definitely want you to be involved. So if you haven't received the information from Alex yet, please let me know so that way we can make sure that that is set up for you um, because that is going to be important that your voice is heard. And um, as you were talking about Kendall, we're changing culture, it's painful because we're reflecting. And that means that we have to look in the mirror. And sometimes when you look in the mirror, so when I take my glasses, put my glasses on, I'm like, whoa, oh, that's not the Ivy that I saw. When I take my glasses off, I like that because I'm not seeing the up close and those defects and those things that make it painful, right? To look at that reflection. So it's going to be painful, but we have to be able to change the culture and we have to have those hard and honest conversations and get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's one of the things I just wanna say, I appreciate so much about your conversation and I appreciate so much about your honesty um, as we continue this um, journey. I have begun in the last few weeks meeting already with the with some teams to talk about the cultural centers and the physical spaces. So we are making movements there, but I think it's important um, that we have a regular meeting so that you can hear it. I know the four months as you're meeting with all of administration might not show you some of the things that are happening along the way, but then also what are we thinking about long, what, are, what else do we need? Like I always say that this is a great start, but we need to continue and we need to have to make sure that we're looking at as you were talking about Marianne, what are the systemic things? What are the things that we need to look at in the curriculum and our pedagogy? What are those other pieces that we can start to think about collectively so if we can schedule some time to meet regularly, that'll help us to hold us accountable, number one. That'll help us to think about other ways that we can think about projects and being innovative about changing the culture and really think about those systemic things, policies, all of those things um, that can be impacting the way that we navigate the space. Yeah, I think that um, the other thing is addressing issues of policing within the University of Arizona. And something that we all recall from our last meeting is that people said, yes, we're committed to divesting funds from UAPD. And we were okay with settling with that because we understand that like, the university, I guess, is not ready to think about a university where policing is not needed. So why is it that we can't divest funds from UAPD? And I think that the other thing is, how are we looking at other ways to solve issues without immediately saying UAPD has to be present? Because there are situations where UAPD does not need to be present because it's not necessary. And the last thing that we recall is that um, the idea was protecting the community and students, but in those situations where there's Black students present and there's Indigenous students present and there's all of these marginalized students who are present who have a very traumatic and triggering and history of policing and a difficult relationship with them, that does, that does not mean that like policing is not protection. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't see policing as safety or as humanizing as you all think. And it's so it's like, how do we move away from calling UAPD on the spot when there's an issue or that doesn't involve policing? Um, I think it was Lisa and then Liesl. Thank you, Marianne. I, I, I think that one of the first steps is this evaluation of UAPD that I described. And I would love for you all to participate in that process so that our consultants can hear directly from you. Part of the evaluation will be looking at, at the practices here at University of Arizona and comparing those to 
best practices across the country. And part of the evaluation will be about the budget for UAPD. So I, I need more information to help the executive team and UAPD determine what is the right size of the budget for UAPD itself and also what is the right size of the budget for the other units who would provide support if UAPD is not the first responder. So if we're sending out uh, a mental health counselor or, or someone from student services, we're likely to need to increase the funding for those particular organizations because they don't have 24 seven support like we do in UAPD. So this will be an ongoing process uh, the evaluation I mentioned, um, we expect to have the report from Margolis Healy in the beginning of 2021, and we'll commit to uh, the, the same budget cycle that we have for the rest of our institution, where we set budgets for the following year in the spring semester. Liesl? Thank you, Marianne. Um, I think this is a critically important issue. Um, and uh, one of the challenges that we uh, face as we address exactly this issue is that we, and one of the reasons why the immediate response is uh, not to defund the UAPD is because that would mean that when people rang 911, we would have TPD coming onto campus. And that for most of us doesn't seem like the best path forward. Uh, we do a lot of work, uh, and I am grateful to Brian Seastone and his team for working really hard to keep our students who do make mistakes sometimes out of the criminal justice system. Now, I am not covering up that we have huge problems with policing in America, but I do want to be really intentional and thoughtful about not heading in a worse direction, but instead making sure we're heading in a direction that reduces the harm uh, to um, our uh, minority and underrepresented students across the board. I think that it's actually kind of hard for us to even imagine what that looks like in America. We don't have a shining example that we can point to and say that's the kind of policing we want. We talk about community policing, but most people actually don't have a lot of clarity about what that means on the ground or how to implement it. So I applaud Lisa's um, and Brian's efforts to bring in a review team to figure out what are the steps we can take to move in the direction of having much better responses? And I think it's very, very obvious that calling uh, the police out every time there's some issue that might in fact be to do with mental health, might just be to do with a disagreement, doesn't end, in, doesn't end well in many, many, many cases and particularly for uh, people of color. So I think we're all in agreement that what we've got isn't the right answer. Uh, but I think we have to be really intentional about moving in the direction that improves that doesn't and doesn't put us in a worse situation, if that makes sense. I do want to add that after COBA released its list of demands, a great many students took it upon themselves to say, we need the police to be on campus because bad stuff really does happen sometimes that really does require the attention of police. And we would rather it was UAPD, not TPD coming on campus. Both because, both because they're more responsive, because they look close by, but also because they understand students better, because they do do training around student, student issues, around um, trying to help people stay out of the criminal justice system. So that is complicated and it'll take us time. And I think we have to look at that as a transformation process that will take time. But we are, Lisa and I and Brian, are very, very committed to working in that direction. If people have good ideas that they think haven't been considered, I thoroughly welcome you to bring them forward. I think it's a really interesting subject for the whole country right now. And we have an opportunity to do something that's really original if we can um, focus on what are those steps that take us in a direction that's, um, that changes the outcomes for many people of color. Lonnie, do you have a response to that? Yes. Um... So in, I think in one of the community norms that we talked about, I said you have to be precise and please respect that we do, you know, our time. So this is Lisa, like what, we don't want anything like, yeah, we're working on this alternative. What exactly are you doing? If you don't want to defund the police, then what is the other alternative? Can you give us that exact alternative? Yeah. So, um, 
you know, Lonnie, I'm going to say something radical because I come from a very different country where policing is a very different thing. Um, and so I do think there are radical solutions out there. Um, and those radical solutions involve um, exactly as Lisa mentioned, um, that uh, when somebody does dial 911, that there is a triaging process to make sure that the people that are sent out to deal with whatever the issue is, have the right skills um, to deal with um, the humans that are involved. And if that is, if somebody rings and says that somebody is mentally unstable, that somebody has a health issue that they're dealing with or a mental health issue that they're dealing with, that we have somebody on standby who can go out and becomes the first responder, even if there, there are police there as backup as well. So there are other models, but there are not other models in place in America that are great role models, but there are other models around the world that we can look at. And Lonnie, I am, uh, and I'm just delighted that Brian is interested in exploring different ideas about how to do this well. Um, and Lisa's analysis that she's um, got a consultant coming in to do will be the first step in that direction. What are our strengths? Where we do not see strengths and where's the opportunity for us? Malika, you had a response. Yeah, so you say that you're from another country and mm -hmm. I've researched a lot about Australia and how they have handled a certain situation such as like gun violence and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And if you know that there's other opportunities, we could start at the campus. I have yet to see a cop handle sexual assault cases, let alone when they are called, things already have dispersed, cops are called after a crime, not before a crime happens. So I'm not trying to discredit what cops do. I think that people who fear the lack of law and order just are not educated enough to understand how there can be other alternatives. And for someone who comes from a country where they have exhausted other alternatives and it has worked so well. Mm -hmm. You should be trying to implement that on campus and being as like example for other universities to try, just like you just propose someone like a social worker going in mm -hmm. and doing mental health checks and wellness checks and having an officer behind them and not in sight so there's no immediate threat the person feels calm and they're not already in like a jumpy ex anxious state to want to react that's a start that's literally what the question was about was what are other alternatives so we don't need policing and again um chief C C Stone, this isn't about taking away your money or your job it's just to better our community and kind of de-escalate and shift towards this power complex that we're dealing with within the country and it kind of can start at this university. So, you know, that was all you had to say, Liesl, and that's just all I wanted to respond with. Two just quick points, Malika. Australian policing is not a perfect thing and there's plenty of racism in Australian policing, just get that out there. <laughs> it is just very different and, and in some ways it is, it is um, uh, it has had better outcomes, but I would point to other countries as well. There are many different practices around the world and I'm not holding up my own um, as being exemplary because it is not. There have been unambiguously and heinous racist uh, outcomes there as well. But um, I do think we can learn a lot from other countries and how they engage uh, with their communities. And I think it would be a great, uh, it'd be great for us to work in that direction with Brian and with his team who, you know, we're all a product of our training. And that's as true for police as it is for all the rest of us. We all are a product of the culture we've been brought up in. And that is hard to change. As Lisa noted earlier, it'll take some time to, to settle on what the model should be and then to work in that direction. I also wanted to um, summarize the, the, point, the main point of, for us our, on our end as students is no police at all, uh, meaning no police. Like you can't say that you're trying to fix the policing within our campus by bringing in alternatives that are literally just policing. That's the point. Um, and it's like moving away from this thing of we need police at scene. 
And like policing doesn't mean like just uniform cops like Brian Seastone in this space right now. It can mean you all bringing in someone who is ununiformed on site who is still a police officer or who is still perpetrating systems of policing onto students. And so that's what we're talking about is how do we move away from this idea of policing? And I think that's the main discussion and like what we're trying to push for. But um, do other students have any responses or thoughts or anything? Riley, go ahead. Yeah, before we like close out, I just wanted to bring up something that happened in the beginning um, of the meeting because I feel like it shouldn't be left unaddressed. Um, Liesl, when we first asked about like the specifics of like what you're doing, um, I feel like your attitude is very negative and I just wanted to bring up community norm number eight where students are not your support subordinates. Um, I feel like you came out very defensive immediately um, and I understand things are hard and like this is an uncomfortable space but the way you addressed us was absolutely unacceptable and I will not allow you to speak like this in front of all of our students and all of our members because we do not deserve to be treated that way. Um, we asked for just basic, like, what have you been doing? And like specifics, everyone else was able to address it properly and they said what they needed to say. Um, but I feel like you came off in a really passive aggressive tone. And if you don't wanna work with us and like you have like your own, um, if you have like your own like opinions about the demands and whatnot, like please like don't waste our time like this. I really do not want to be treated like a 12 year old. I'm not here to be talked down to. I'm here to organize and I'm here to make this campus a better place for marginalized students because right now it's honestly like a living hell being here, being talked down to by my professors, by like people on campus, by like administrators like this like don't i i'm just like very i'm so upset by the way you were talking to us um and i just i literally can't even i can't even i don't have words to express how like disrespectful that was so in the future please come to us um like we're your equals because we are smart and we're here to work and if you can't handle that then that's not my problem Riley, thank you for sharing that. I apologize for, for being offensive. It wasn't my intention. My frustration is not directed at you, but that we can't seem to get past rules and get to an honest dialogue. And I hope we will get to that. It is my earnest aspiration that we can work through the demands and actually resolve how do we move in a direction of goodness. I don't know how we get there when we can't seem to just have open flowing dialogue. Uh, I hope we get there. But if written communication works better, we can do that. It's a long list. It's going to take time. It's 21 significant issues. It's like how we get there. So I'm only looking for input and I apologize if I came off as defensive. I don't feel particularly defensive, but I do feel frustrated. I feel frustrated that we can't just sit in open, honest dialogue and hear from all of you what your responses are, what are the nuances behind these demands, because there are really nuanced issues behind many of those demands, like yeah. really important nuance about how we move forward. And uh, I don't know how we get there with, with regulations that say, you have to stop talking after two minutes and you have to do this, so you have to do that. I just, that doesn't feel like we can e easily hear from many voices and hear in an active, lively dialogue. How do you think about these issues? How do, and these are hard, hard issues. And I applaud all of you who put the list together. And you did a great job collectively of making it succinct. But behind every one of those 21 points, there's a world of depth that we need to get into at some point. So I look forward to that. And I hope we get there. Because otherwise, we're kind of flying blind without the inputs that we really need. Okay, yeah, I understand that, but we also have one hours, like segments, like we came here, we're like, okay, two hours, like these are our meeting times, like please, and then you're like, oh, well, the president can only meet here for like 
like three minutes between 903 and like whatever and then he doesn't show up and then like everyone's like oh like we can't like do it like doesn't meet our schedule like when are we going to be prioritized because we've been asking over and over and over and y'all are just like okay like no and like also today no one said anything about like two minutes like and also we didn't ask you to go through like the entire like list of demands one by one like we do want to have that meeting but we can't because y'all aren't accommodating y'all aren't prioritizing us like we've been asking and so like we can't you can't put the blame on us i'm not blaming i just want to get there okay no blame well, okay. but riley let me just say i'm sorry i misinterpreted i thought you did want to get through the list that was my confusion i okay. thought we were going to you know actually work through that today yeah we only had an hour <laughs> so we can't really get through the whole list so open up your schedules, free up your schedules. We're ready to talk. We've been ready. So make time. What would you propose, Riley? What's the right strategy? Because we can't, I mean, you're right. One hour and 21 items, not, not viable. So what, what's your strategy? Like how, what would you suggest? Um, opening up your schedules. We want, we want meetings. We want open communication. But can we break it down into some chunks of work and we can get into groups and figure out like let's chunk off the stuff that's about policing let's chunk off the stuff that's about um the multicultural centers and student support mechanisms right does that make sense like to find a way to carve it up so that we can get work done together does someone else want to take this i really can't speak to her anymore <laughs> i'm sorry yeah i mean that does make sense and that's what we've done on our own but we haven't seen that from you Okay, so are there teams on your side that we could match, Noah? Um, potentially, it depends on when you're all able to meet. Like again, we're all students, we all work, we all have family, Understood. and then on top of that, we're all part of a lot of other organizations. And on top uh -huh. of that, we decided to come together for this. So right. it's really on all of you guys to come because you are being paid a ridiculous amount of money to one be speaking to us this way, and then two to be kind of pushing these aside. So again, free up your schedule. Let us know when you guys are free and we'll come to you. Uh, okay, so what I was uh, suggesting is that we might want to, um, so I think one of the challenges is every time you try and get everyone together, that creates a calendar nightmare. So how do we, can we chunk it up so that we have like work groups that don't require the entire executive team to try and turn up at the same time? Because I think that's not a good use of, we won't get a lot done that way and it will make it slow. Whereas if we can get together with work groups um, from, you, from your team, from COBA, and uh, the right people on the leadership side, we can get a lot of progress a lot faster. Can that possibly work? Or is it important to you to have everybody together all the time? I think that Michelle has a response. Go ahead, Michelle. I feel like the point that we're all to make is that it's not up to us to do that. It's up to you guys because, like Riley and Noah said, we are all ready to discuss this. And it seems like you all do not care about talking about this. And you guys do not care about discussing this. But like we've all been saying, we are ready to talk about it. We are ready. And you just don't give us the time that we deserve, and that we, and the respect that we deserve, and that we need either. So that's what we're saying. It's not up to us that trying to put the the responsibility on us to keep up with all these things. It's up to you guys to open up your schedules, to free up time to make 
different for us because we do not have time for that. We are students, we have family, some of us work multiple jobs, all these other things. So it's not up to us to be doing the job that you guys are being paid for. We're not being paid for this. We're doing this because it is something that we um, are passionate about. And we want change. And it seems like we want change, but you, you don't want change really. And also, I would appreciate it if you stop asking us what we want to do and making teams and making committees because that is, that is it's just too much right now. Right now, we're just focusing on trying to at least get some time to talk to all of you guys at once. And, and, and like we said, the president is not even here. So it's not up to us, and please stop trying to get us to be the ones to do the work that you guys should be doing and what you guys should be figuring out. All right. All right, thank you so much, Michelle. I think that the overall thing is we need every person in, exec in the ELT team to be part of these conversations. And it's unfair for you to ask us to remove policing and multicultural um, issues part of the list of demands from the list of demands that makes no sense like that's what we're advocating for the multicultural centers are the places where actually um they focus on our identities as black indigenous queer trans people and they do what they need to do to accommodate our needs and to listen to us and to make sure that we have all the resources that we have do the thing that we need to do as students on our campus. And so the thing, again, is going back to institutional support. And when we're talking about institutional support, it's important that the ELT people are able to be part of these discussions. Mm -hmm. And so for you to try and break these things up, it's, no, we're not doing that. Like, if you all want to be part of these discussions and you all want to do the work, it means being able to accommodate student needs. It means being able to center student needs. It's being able to say, can I clear up my schedule to have this important discussion that affects every single person in this space? So you trying to push these things of like, oh, you need to do this or you need to break up this or we can meet, like that doesn't work for us. Because we okay. have- I hear you. It doesn't I work for us. Just an idea. I thought it might help us move forward faster. But I can keep moving forward the way we're doing it. Cool. Anyone else have anything else before I like go through the endings? Sorry that we're like over time. Um, so, so I know that Riley had said before, please prevent yourself from being passive aggressive. But what you you did just now to somebody. She basically said stop being passive aggressive because that's exactly what just happened. So I, if you could address this like we're adults and not just immediately be defensive, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyways, I think that the other, in terms of our expectations and moving forward, um, we are going to send a follow-up email of the notes that we took this meeting. Um, the major things that we are looking forward to is the website um, and then the notes and um, everything that Lisa proposed, I mean, Lisa proposed, and then um, the project manager, we're going to get back to you on that, Ivy. Thank you so much. Um, and then the other thing is the more detailed, comprehensive UAPD budget. Um, also, the other thing that we forgot to mention was that I know that back in July, the list of demands is broken up into departments who will be held responsible for completing them. We were wondering if we were able to get a list of contacts of those departments and the people who will be in leadership in terms of addressing the list of demands. Um, cool. Absolutely, cool. And then um, I think that for 
for Liesl, I think one thing that you can do for mm -hmm. these meetings is probably read the book White Fragility and understand how you are taking up space in these meetings and be able to do better. And obviously we can't do anything else. So that is a resource that you can actually look into is right fragility, because I think that it addresses a lot of the issues of how you've shown up in this space and how you choose to talk about these issues. But other than that, does anyone have any other comments, questions, thoughts, or concerns before we end this meeting? Cool. And again, we'll just send up a follow-up email of everything that we just discussed. So thank you all so much for being in this meeting. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. And welcome to the dialogue. Thank you all.